Okay, so as I mentioned earlier this morning, folks, we're delighted to have Samantha Morton and Barack Floyd, our colleagues from the US with us this morning, to share some of their lessons and what it has taken to build and maintain health justice partnerships, or in the US context, medical legal partnerships. We're even more delighted to have James Tufel here, who will be moderating this discussion with Samantha and Baraka. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to James. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just let me know if you can't hear me, um, but I'm going to try to speak to both audiences, both here <laughs> and in back of me. Um, so one of the things I think that's interesting is the history of medical legal partnership in the United States. Could you describe a little bit of your experience in the history of the MLP movement in the United States and why you think MLPs are important? Uh, Dr. Floyd, I'm happy to go first based on my vintage. Does that sound okay? I think that's <laughs> <laughs> and, and before I do, I just want to acknowledge that Dr. Floyd and I have a valued colleague whose name appears on your screen. Franny Zhang is uh, MLPB's content lead. Uh, her role will become more uh, clear to you over the course of the evening, but for tonight's purposes or today's purposes, as the case may be, she will be projecting uh, various content and images on the screen to animate our conversation. So thank you to Health Justice uh, Australia. Thank you to uh, Jim. Thank you to my colleagues. And um, I think the best way to answer uh, your question, uh, Jim, is to say that when I joined this movement 16 years ago, I had been practicing traditional uh, litigation law in uh, a, private, a large private law firm in downtown Boston. I knew that I was um, wanting to pursue a public interest law career or a civil rights law career, depending on the jargon of the day. And I couldn't believe my luck when I heard that a safety net hospital, a hospital that served uh, largely people who couldn't afford care or who were on our country's Medicaid program to help subsidize healthcare was hiring lawyers not just into the general counsel's office, not just into the in-house legal team for the hospital, but was actually hiring lawyers to represent patients with health-harming legal needs. That began my journey in 2003 of actually going to work every day wearing a pager or a beeper and responding to pediatricians like Dr. Floyd when their patients uh, had the following kinds of concerns. Samantha, can you please represent Mrs. Alvarez and her family? in their deportation proceedings in court next week? Or could you please represent Ms. Simone and her family in eviction court tomorrow? Because I was privileged to work with a, the first generation and, and, and enduring generations of clinicians in our country who recognized that actually aspects of our society were making people sick and that that was not something they had the tools internally within healthcare to treat. So that is why I continue to think that medical legal partnership and health justice work is important. Dr. Floyd? Yeah, so um, piggybacking off of what Samantha said, I first knew of what ML the MLP movement was as a resident um, during my training to be a pediatrician. Um, and the case that made this most, um, this highlighted this the most for me is I had a patient who was an eight-year-old who had really severe asthma um, who were talking about his asthma management and all the medications that we need. And the mom happens to mention that there's mold in their home and asking further questions, we find out that there's tons of habitability issues. They have cockroaches, they have mice. Um, they weren't aware of how to try to get those issues remedied, but they were afraid that it was making his asthma worse. So by connecting them with our MLP partner, they were able to work with the family and their landlord to get the situation remedied. And seeing the kid back two months later, his asthma was way better. So for me, it showed me MLP in action um, and how my role as a pediatrician is important, but it's not the be all end all because I don't have the capacity nor the time um, to be able to help families remedy the issue, which for him was his housing. Um, I currently work at a federally qualified health care center, which is a safety net clinic that serves patients who are on public insurance. Most of my patients are black or brown patients and are mixed status, meaning that 
some of the people in their household mm -hmm. are folks who have documentation and have a green card or legal status within our country, and then others do not. Um, so for us, that creates an additional layer where legal help is so important in helping families discern what services they qualify for, what services are safe for them to use, because there are some services um, and benefits that make it difficult for a person who is undocumented or doesn't have papers to be able to change their status to document it in the future. Um, and that's where we see a lot of our questions for our MLP. The other needs that come up for us frequently are educational needs. Um, we'll have children that might have speech delay or other types of education problems who need therapies either within the school district or outside the school district. Um, and for a lot of our underserved patients or um, patients who are on public insurance, they might not know their rights. And even if they do, um, they don't feel like they can assert them. So being able to have our MLP involved and helping us to recognize what legal issues are popping up for our families that are affecting their health, um, and then have, having the backup to have someone to counsel this family and educate them about their rights and advocate with them um, is also very valuable. Great, thank you. Um, so I have another sort of two-part question based on your experiences. What do you see as key characteristics or objectives of MLPs, and how do you deal with the issue of integrating sort of lawyers and medical providers or legal services and medical services? You want to go first this time, Baraka? Sure. Um, so I'm going to answer the second half um, first, actually. Um, so I think this also speaks to the importance of defining what type of partnership that you want. Um, so partnerships on this like continuum of we sit in the same room, we do our jobs, and we don't really talk to one another um, versus really having someone that's completely integrated into your healthcare team. Um, so in an ideal world, um, a health justice partner or a legal partner is able to in some way integrate within the team um, so that when these legal issues come up, there's direct communication back and forth so that we can keep each other updated along the course um, of the problem that we're trying to address. Um, what's challenging about that um, is just the complexity of the system in general. Um, so on the medical side, um, insurance, different um, availability of services based on what insurance you have makes it challenging for us on the healthcare side to manage and coordinate care. Um, similarly, there are complexities on the legal side, which I'll let Samantha speak to, um, that can sometimes make it difficult to share information. Um, one of the things that comes up often is because once you had a client relationship with a patient, um, there are certain things that you don't share with us back and forth. Um, so that information sharing piece is often a barrier um, to being able to get the team completely integrated. Um, for our MLP, we have our patients sign a release that allows us to communicate back and forth about them um, being contacted by our MLP and what the course of their case is. Um, I'll let Samantha speak a little bit more to some other innovative ways people have gotten around that. Um, the other thing that's come up for us, um, locally at least, is that when you have someone that's just co-located in your clinic, um, what can happen is if nobody's coming up to them, it feels like time that is not being spent well. Um, so really continuing to try to make the case for the presence of that person physically and other things that they can do that can allow them to contribute to the team and also receive benefits from being part of the team um, are things that we have to constantly continue to work on um, to kind of prove the value of having um, a legal partner as an integrated part of your team. Does that answer your question? Yes. How about I pick up there? I think it's a great two-part question. And like Dr. Floyd, I'm going to take it in reverse order. I think part two of your question, Jim, is about when you ask about integration, it's really a systems question. How do two sectors or more uh, integrate met their skilled team members to achieve objectives, right? And your first question about objectives to me goes more to people and policies meaning the people that we're all in this work to serve. And I do think, and this may become a theme in the course of our conversation, it's really important for us not to let in health justice work, the integration itself become the end goal. It's a means to an end. It is not the end itself. And 
Dr. Floyd mentioned a lot of great examples of, of operational barriers and even cultural barriers to rapid uh, integration between the legal and health sectors and legal and health workforce in, in the United States. I think the key word there though is rapid. It's not, it's not that this isn't happening. It's not that it, it's just hard work because it takes a lot of people who are um, brave and creative thinkers to, and, and to get those people in leadership positions to figure out the kinds of solutions that Dr. Floyd has mentioned. Um, so, so I think the integration piece remains challenging, but it's also um, uh, part of the process. And, uh, you know, in addition to information sharing and confidentiality, um, another piece of the puzzle that, <coughs> excuse me, our program, MLPV, which operates in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, thinks a lot about is conflict of interest. And in many ways, the medical legal partnership movement, the health justice movement, uh, have been long premised on the alignment of shared interests in a mutual constituency or mutual constituencies between the legal and health sectors. And we just wanna make sure we're not ever making too many assumptions about that. So I can come back to that later. In terms of objectives, um, this is a moment where I'd like to talk about going upstream. And I'm not sure whether that the jargon of the downstream upstream continuum is something that resonates for this room in health justice work, but it's something that means a lot to us here increasingly, because after many years of carrying that beeper and helping families in high stakes, urgent and um, uh, consequential life-changing uh, legal proceedings that were also uh, health contexts for them, we started to ask ourselves in our program, does working downstream, does operating in acute legal care in partnership with acute health care actually meet people in the most human-centered place and in the most preventive place, which is why we decided to start doing root cause analysis and mapping um, what earlier nodes of, inter of intervention we might support. Um, and so uh, if it's possible, this is a moment where I would invite a screen share of a, um, a visual that we've generated at MLPB going to your question about objectives, Jim. Um, uh, you know, we've really been become interested in mapping, for example, in the context of, um, of housing instability. Uh, what will it, um, what will it uh, take to actually detect um, a risk of housing instability in an American household. Uh, when I was uh, recruited 16 years ago, typically I was brought in to support a family and partner with them in problem solving. When they were minimally in the orange zone, the landlord had sent a notice and they were on their way to a court proceeding or already there. What our program has spent about 10 years doing is looking earlier at earlier stages of, of risk uh, that can thrust uh, people into these kinds of risk trajectories. And then of course, what's not reflected on this slide, but will be in the next iteration is public policy. So when, when you ask about the objectives, Jim, I think that we, we all need to be thinking, um, if you will, in pre-legal ways as legal partners. Great, thank you. And so, um, related to the points that you're speaking to, um, given that the movement in the United States is about 20 years old, and Samantha, your vintage is, is <laughs> a bit longer than me, but I've seen some changes as well. What are some mm -hmm. of the key changes that you've seen across time? Mm -hmm. Like, if you had to you know, pick out one or two things, what are the key elements that you've learned in changing? Oh, um, I, I, I think there really is a much more um, uh, nuanced um, approach to levels of impact. Uh, medical legal partnerships in the U.S. are asking very good questions about the kinds of impact they're achieving um, at different levels, you know, individual levels, system levels, policy levels, and are giving thought, giving more thought than historically to how to organize their services to achieve those levels. Uh, I also think that in terms of the evolution of, M of MLP in our country, um, we can't um, 
we can't forget that some of that history aligns with some profound transformation in healthcare delivery and financing at the national level because of the passage of the Affordable Care Act. So I think there's more um, under appreciation and understanding for how the future of healthcare uh, systems in the United States might be re um, a more active piece of the puzzle in terms of more health justice. And Baraka, what are your thoughts? Um, so I've only been involved with this work for about the past seven years, um, but I will piggyback off of Samantha um, in that with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, there has been much more of a shift towards systemic advocacy um, and kind of looking at um, levels of impact in terms of on a policy level versus on an individual level. Um, the other thing that um, we've seen locally is a lot more attention to identifying problems before they become emergencies and doing so in a way that's aligned with medical care. Um, again, a lot of that has to do with new payment structures in the United States where screening for identifying and addressing social determinants of health are things for which um, the medical system can get paid. Um, so that has very much pushed a lot of people on the medical side to start being a lot more holistic about the way that we deliver care, um, which for our legal partners um, is a great, has been a great opportunity to collaborate in the way that care at the bedside is delivered. Thank you. And, and to build off some of your points related to impact, right? Thinking about your elevator pitch when you're speaking to people who hold power or funders, or other people in the community, when you're sharing your value, what would you say your one or two key success points are, your key impacts that you've made on people or communities? You wanna start, Baraka? Sure, um, so the one thing for our MLP especially um, that we highlight um, is one, we do a lot of work around access to appropriate services for children. Um, so we have, through impacts litigation, been able to, um, make sure that children with autism do receive appropriate therapy. That's the gold standard and it's covered by insurance. Um, and over the course of implementing this law um, that opens up this therapy for families to be covered by insurance, um, we've done persistent work to continue improving the system so that wait periods decrease, so that people are getting therapy that's actually good therapy um, and working and collaborating with the health plans and people who deliver services um, in order to try to make sure that our children are getting the services that they need in a timely fashion. So what we say is right care at the right time at the right place. Um, and then the other part um, is we do a lot of education um, and capacity building. Um, so probably about 30% of our effort is spent educating different care teams around um, the safety net clinics and our quaternary care or subspecialized pediatric hospital um, that care for these patients so that we can continue to improve the way that we identify um, legal rights, risks, and remedies. So not just the um, individual things that we do for patients in direct services, but really operating in the system um, on both ends in capacity building and trying to improve systems and streamline. That's not a two minute elevator pitch, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think the health, the health justice elevator pitch is a global struggle this many years on. And I'm sure we have that as a common bond with our colleagues in the room. I would just add in response to this good um, uh, laser light question, Jim, that when, when MLPB is pitching the work, the training and technical assistance work, the capacity building work that we do with, with health organizations and health teams, what we say is um, if you are attempting social need problem solving in a team-based environment that does not include a civil rights lawyer, you are not serving your, your patients effectively because there is no way that the staff that you currently have has the, is equipped to be bringing that 360 degree lens on benefits law, on housing law, on uh, laws protecting people from domestic violence. And so let us come and have one of our legal advisors embed in one of your interdisciplinary team meetings. And you can see for yourself over the course of 60 or 90 minutes, how your problem solving strategies change, evolve and get stronger because that person with that training and that know-how is bringing their ears and their brain to your 
your excellent and well-intentioned problem-solving process that is currently missing a key ingredient. Great, thank you. And so I'll have a question for you, Samantha, and then after that, I'll have a question for you, Baraka. Um, the, the first question to you, Samantha, I think it's going to probably relate it to one of my areas of fixation, which is the access to justice gap in the United States, which is a rich country abomination, right? But um, the, related to that, you speak about the issues of creating a village of legal partners. What do you mean by that? I'm assuming it's metaphorical, right? Um, what do you mean by creating a village? Um, it is not metaphorical. <laughs> so thank you for that. Thank you for that for that question. Although I do like the symbolism and the metaphors. Um, when I, this is a great follow up question because uh, I don't. I, I am a learner when it comes to the Australian health justice community, and I am a learner with respect to the different um, sectors in Australia that that are integrating in this in an exciting way. So with that caveat. Let me say that in our in the United States, it is not typical. It is not typical for um, lawyers to be trained as generalists, like medical professionals. Uh, we are trained in our country as specialists, even subspecialists. There is a quality assurance and quality control dimension to that that is admirable, but it also, uh, in our experience, can be limiting in the capacity building. Uh, dimensions of MLP if the if the lawyer who integrates into a team meeting where patients are experiencing the many many kinds of challenges uh, with systems that Dr. Floyd referenced earlier if that person only brings um, profound depth uh, in one area and very little breadth across a range of civil rights domains so when we think about uh, when, when we talk about a village of legal, legal partners we're thinking about um, uh, those who bring generalist expertise as well as those who bring specialist expertise. And actually, this is a, a good moment, um, Franny, to throw up the slide on team facing and family facing. Um, Jim, I will, I will keep this brief, I promise, but we are at MLPB increasingly thinking about uh, our work as having two different dimensions. Uh, and in fact, while for many years we did both kinds of work, now by virtue of some important concerns around conflict of interest. Our organization exclusively focuses on team-facing legal partnering. Um, uh, and, and this is where if you sort of scroll to the right with your eyes, you can see that the key skills and qualifications are legal generalist capacity and as, as well as capacity to distill complex legal landscapes and policy landscapes for cross-sector stakeholders. In contrast to the equally important family-facing or, or consumer-facing legal partnering, which would contemplate the kind of direct legal assistance that is most, I would say, um, uh, traditionally associated with health justice work and which, again, we consider critical and essential, but, but, not, but calls upon a different skill set, a different... Um, cultural identity in some legal organizations and in fact in some lawyers and legal professionals. And so for all of these reasons, professional culture, professional skills, and, um, and being very proactive about avoiding conflict of interest, when we talk about uh, a village of legal partners, we're actually being quite concrete in thinking about uh, those who are doing capacity building work and those who are doing direct legal representation and that being part of the same village, a complementary village. Thank you. I, I now know it's not a metaphor, that there's an actual structure <laughs> to it. Uh, so I've learned things today. Um, thank you, Samantha. Um, yeah. Baraka, the question for you is, I think it's going to be in part related to the issue of integration, but also a little bit different, right? What do you find as far as value from these interdisciplinary partnerships that you couldn't get in a different structure of just a referral setting or co-location setting? So what is special about that interdisciplinary, inter-service experience of an MLP? Yeah, so um, I want to start first by um, saying that, as Samantha said, transactional or co-location is not wrong per se. Um, and we continue as we're 
reformulating our partnerships and thinking about how to become more effective, um, you should always be continually thinking about what are new issues that are arising, what are new challenges for us on, in our sector, what are new challenges for our partners mm -hmm. in their sector, and continue to reassess and kind of re manage your partnership based on those things because we know for a fact that those things are going to change over time. Um, and when I think about a successful partnership, it's really that you have two or more groups that are using their relative strengths and weaknesses to support a common cause. The cause doesn't have to be exactly the same, um, but by both of us working towards our objectives, we're able to further move forward our um, individual objectives for the medical side and legal side or whoever else might be involved. For in our MLP, the way that I think about it is we support each other. Um, in our specific areas where it's challenging. So because of the complicated population that we serve, um, having reliable backup for legal issues is really important. That comes in a couple of ways. So we do um, what at MLP they call rapid consults where we, if they're not here, we can call our MLP and discuss an issue with them and they can give us first steps to work with the family so we can start the process then. Um, and then obviously for us, capacity building. Um, as we learn more from our legal partners through working together to serve patients and through education, um, we are better able to identify issues that are health harming legal issues. For our legal partners on their side, um, in particular what's helpful in our partnership um, is that we're able to provide a lot of context for them for health issues that might be occurring as a result of legal issues. Um, so really working together directly to serve that one patient. Um, but then for our legal partners, by partnering with us um, as a legal aid or um, a, an agency that provides legal services to people that um, meet certain income restrictions, um, there we provide them access to clients that actually need their support. Um, so it decreases the need for um, outreach, which usually is not a problem for legal aids, to be honest, um, but just making that point. Um, the other things, we meet periodically as a leadership team for our MLP, where we talk a lot about trends and emerging issues that um, could require systemic advocacy. Um, it works both ways for us. So because our legal partners are partnered with multiple different agencies across our county, they're able to get a better sense of what the milieu is for the entire population. Whereas for myself as a general pediatrician, I see hey. patients in our clinic and I see patients at the hospital, um, but that's the only thing that I see. So we're really able to give each other a reality check on the state of affairs, the challenges that people are experiencing, and then really better understanding what community partners have been most helpful to our patients um, and places where we might need to work with partners to improve. Um, and then the other thing recently, um, what has come up for us as an example, is for children who have a certain level of disability and require around the clock care from a parent, they can qualify for a particular benefit where they actually get paid to care for their child. Mm -hmm. Through these leadership meetings, we were able to recognize that a lot of our patients who have these complex medical and developmental needs actually are not connected to this benefit and don't even know what it is. Um, so for us, what that highlighted is the need to one, provide further education to clinicians so we know when these things, um, this is a benefit that could be helpful for a family. Um, and then two, um, making sure that policy-wise, there aren't new things that are coming up as we're thinking about um, some of the immigration challenges we're having in our country right now. Um, and then the other part I think about um, is really pushing us to work towards the top of our licenses. Um, so we often um, disagree on how we're going to get to that end goal just because of the difference in training that we have. Um, but having these discussions really allows for us to think about what's best for the community, our respective roles as medical and legal or other partners on the team, and then how we can work together um, in order to allow us to reach the objective of making sure that benefits, services, and supports are available for families when they're necessary, um, and that legal issues um, that are arising can be remedied either on a systemic level or an individual level or somewhere in between. Thank you. Um, in my experience here, because I've had the opportunity to experience the Health Justice Australia Conference, um, one of the things that I find interesting, and Samantha, you could correct me if I'm wrong because I have gray hair and I might be mis misremembering things, but what I've seen here is there's a lot more of an intentional focus on systems change or policy advocacy 
in how the movement is getting driven at this stage in its development mm -hmm. relative to what we saw in the United States. Um, so, but now where we sit in the United States, that's certainly a key element as well. So both Baraka and Samantha, related to systems change and policy advocacy, um, how do you make, one question is, how do you make that happen, right? How do you structure mm -hmm. it, um, you know, with the direct service versus system policy change balance? Mm -hmm. And the other issue is, what have been some of your maybe key successes in that area? I'm happy to start, uh, okay. Baraka, just by saying, uh, and, and forgive me if this question reveals naivete, my Australian colleague, but do you use the metaphor, uh, shall we use a carrot or a stick in your, in your work? Um, okay, so this is, a, this is a, at least a Western global metaphor. Um, so uh, I'm, I, I think that in terms of movement maturity and developmental stage, we're at a point when any health justice initiative should be asking itself at the beginning of its goal setting and its co-design process, what resources and expertise do we need in place to, to use carrots to achieve systems change? And what resources and, and expertise do we need in place if we need to carry a big stick? Because you can't know at the beginning of that uh, uh, process together what you might need eventually because all of this is happening in a public policy and environmental uh, political environment that is changing, particularly here in the, way, in the ways that Baraka reference with respect to immigration policy and practice and discretion. So I, I, in many ways, I think that the first 20 years of the American Medical Legal Partnership Movement focused exclusively on carrots and uh, programs were built um, around a carrot strategy. And yet carrots are the beginning, not the end of the toolbox. And so I do think that, uh, at least in, in our country, understanding who by virtue of funding streams and, um, uh, and, and related restrictions on what they can do and who they can and cannot sue is a very important analysis that's relatively young in our movement. And I think that's a really critical part of co-design. Uh, it's not just about how do we get a, a, a part-time lawyer funded to do this, to, to partner with the local health clinic. It's not just about um, how do we come together and oversee these, these operational barriers to integration. It's what do we actually want to have happen and what are all the different tools we might need to, to put in place if we actually want the underlying policies that are driving structural inequities and structural injustice to get resolved. And I think those are tough those are tough questions, but critical questions. What would you say about all this, Baraka? Yeah, I, Samantha, I actually would add to what you said. Um, in terms of identifying issues um, for systemic, identifying lifting up um, mm -hmm. issues for systemic advocacy, one of the key things um, that's important to think about is data collection. Mm -hmm. um, because when you're trying to move things forward to a change, sometimes data is what's needed. Um, so people want to know how many people have this problem, how is this affecting them, what are the outcomes that are affected. Other times it's stories. Um, and in most cases, it's a combination of data and stories that's going to help you move forward. So as you're planning out what things are necessary um, in order to achieve systems change, really thinking about how can I collect data and how can I collect stories. Um, so that as you're on your process, you have everything that you need, depending on who you're pitching to, um, is also a really important part um, of being able to be successful in doing this work. Jim, do we have time for me to add one additional point to Baraka's note? Yes. Okay. I think you had asked us for a specific example. Yes. And, but we are each, uh, Dr. Floyd and I are both uh, fortunate to be part of a project called Dulce, uh, which stands for Developmental Understanding and Legal Collaboration for Everyone. It also means SWEET in Spanish, um, which is a, a, a good fortune for an acronym. Um, so this, this project actually involves not just medical legal collaboration, but also medical legal and early childhood system integration 
and it's a national demonstration project building upon a randomized control trial that was conducted in Boston um, about a decade ago and published in an academic medical journal in 2015. Um, on one of the demonstration sites um, uh, in California actually did exactly what Dr. Floyd described. The partners together identified troubling trends in delays in uh, government health insurance enrollment among newborns, uh, which was having very health harming impacts on those newborns and their families because of uh, uh, delays in care or care avoidance by virtue of concerns about um, you know, unpayable medical debt uh, and related other related challenges that the state office of Medicaid was not um, you know, being accountable for. Uh, and so they, a, a legal aid office, the Neighborhood Legal Services of Los Angeles County, was part of uh, an impact litigation suit that wound up uh, making sure that the state Medicaid office was, in fact, ultimately accountable for, for their obligations to families under state and federal law. And so this is exactly the kind of marriage of data and cross-sector partnership and, um, if you will, carrot and stick strategies that produced positive outcomes for family health. Thank you, Samantha. And what we're gonna do now, I have other questions if, if we need to use them, um, but what I wanna do is also give people in the room an opportunity to ask you questions given your experience, collective experience with NLPs. Um, so I have questions about how or why this is done in the United States, some of the pitfalls, some of the strengths. is around how do you navigate and promote and change culture with in this MLP in this case different cultures coming together right that's one question and then the other area is given that culture how do you integrate your aspirations into reality right so for example um, here in Australia one of the interests is to integrate systems change into the work that's done, but to embed that in culture and practice is a different issue. So how do you navigate culture changes, right, when systems are colliding? And then when it's a traditionally service-based culture, how do you change those cultures to a system policy change focus, right? So there's, mm. there's multiple culture clashes occurring here. Is that about right? Okay, cool. You want to go first, Faraka? So um, I don't think I can answer this without telling a story. I apologize. Um, so um, I am a I am a pediatrician at Stanford, so I'm on faculty here. Um, Stanford, by culture, um, is a very research-driven university. Um, so there's a big premium put on um, inventing new things and coming up with new therapies. Um, Stanford is not always known um, in terms of on the medicine side for advocacy. Um, so one of the things that comes up with us here, um, because the other people that I work with are also Stanford folks, um, is because the things that we value are different, um, it's sometimes hard to get buy-in um, from those people who are mm. oriented differently to the world than I am. Um, and so one of the things that I try to do in my work as kind of the champion of this um, project here um, is to really think about what are the things for the person that you're trying to convince, um, what's important to them, how is what I'm doing going to help push forward whatever it is that they would like to see happen, 
um, or whatever they're interested in so that when you're working to get buy-in, you're doing so in a strategic way um, rather than just kind of jumping up and down and saying, but this is the right thing to do, um, which is what I used to do my first few years out of residency and it was very frustrating. Um, so as we were thinking about how to start screening all of our patients when they come for checkups to our clinic um, for social determinants of health, and then making sure that we address those things, getting buy-in um, from a lot of my colleagues who really felt that that's a social worker's job and it's not ours, it's challenging. Um, but bringing to them data around how these social determinants affect particular um, health issues and health outcomes for children um, and coming up with a plan so that we could try to demonstrate that the work that we're doing is actually pushing forward that objective um, was key in being able to get backup um, and buy-in from the folks here at my clinic. Um, for the legal side, um, what was challenging is as we were doing this, um, we're recognizing that we're going to unearth lots more legal issues that may need help. Um, so having a plan to really um, address or counter some of the hesitation that another partner might have um, is also important. So with our legal team, what we sat down and worked on a lot um, were pathways and processes so that we could try to get where we have a tiered response, where if these types of issues come up and they're not urgent based on the criteria that we came up with together, then we'll call you for a rapid consult. And then these are the things that will go to kind of the second level. So they're non-emergent, but they will need some type of intake from a legal colleague. Um, and those are level two. And then level three is the people who are the, in the legal emergency room per se. Um, so by being able to really try to drill down in terms of culture-wise, what drives that person or what drives that group, um, and thinking about really in a mindful and creative way, frankly, about how what you are trying to achieve is going to help them achieve their endpoint, um, I think is key in trying to navigate these different organizational cultures. I hope that was helpful by using the story. Baraka, I'm so glad you went first because uh, that story was helpful to me. And it, it was really quite specific in terms of your on the ground experience. And now I'm going to indulge by not being concrete, by not sharing a story, and, and really by, by just validating the person who posed this question and what, however many of you are, are for whom this resonates, the gravitational pull of entropy in systems is a powerful force. And I say that not to discourage you, but actually to encourage you that if you are doing health justice work, you have resisted that entropy in very exciting and brave ways. And actually, if you're part of an organization that pays you to do any of this work, they have resisted this entropy in incredible, brave, and profound ways. And so part of the, I think, the strategy here to promote culture change is to keep um, recognizing and celebrating all of that resistance that your work represents and the choices that you're making represent. Um, I love that Dr. Floyd referenced uh, workflows and process maps. If, if, if someone asked uh, a civil legal aid office in the United States that receives federal funding, funding from our federal government, to do a process map or a workflow um, relating to its ability to, to sue the government, <laughs> The, that would be a one box process map that says we can never sue any uh, federal government agency because we get federal funding. And so my advice, which is, which is complementary to Baraka's, is that when we do root cause analyses of uh, social, economic, and environmental problems, we need to do a root cause analysis at the country level and at the city and community level of why it is that it's so hard to finance systems change work. Mm -hmm. Because this will give your community a sense of the kind of daunting leadership challenge that your organization's leaders face. If they have been in a service delivery environment for decades and really probably understand that the critical work is in systems change, and I'm not familiar enough with your system to understand the kinds of restrictions that your organizations may have, relating to who, who you can carry, your, your leadership can carry a big stick with. But I'll tell you here, there's a lot of handcuffs 
on a lot of legal organizations that are quote, doing MLP in quite you know, visionary ways. Uh, and so this is part of why we need to get very serious about looking at our, looking at our own structures mm -hmm. and constraints in the legal community, in the civil rights community, so that we organize our contributions smartly and effectively from a co at the co-design stage, not realizing you know, three years into a project that the partners around the table are not the partners who can solve the problem. Great, thank you, Samantha. And, and this message came up today, uh, or at least yesterday. Um, you shouldn't be shocked um, if you get a lot of your money from the federal government that they're not gonna fund yeah. research and development systems change to take down the federal government. Um, so, so you have to be very mindful of where that funding comes because that also restricts potentially what you could do. Um, how much time do we have left? We still have about 15 or so minutes. That's perfect. Um, <laughs> I'm going to fill that down. Amy, hello. Yeah. Um, I'm Bernadette and I'm going to be um, joining Health Justice Australia in about a month's time. Um, I was really interested in your conversations that you're having about the involvement of the communities that you're working with in sort of, a, I guess, a grassroots level, um, and what are you seeing as some of the challenges? And I know there'll be slightly different challenges uh, from our different countries, but um, what, yeah, what are you finding in those conversations? And to build on that quickly, since I've been here and I've been part of the US movement, the Health Justice Australia movement seems a lot more grassroots than the history of the US movement by far. It's not even close. Mm -hmm. um, so could you speak to grassroots and sort of some of the work that you've done? Brock, I dominated last time. I'm happy to throw it to okay. you and then add my voice. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so one of the um, major things that we try to do, and I say try um, because we're not always successful, um, is to make sure that we are listening to the voices on the ground. Um, that's done in several ways. Um, so the obvious way is the direct service. We're seeing trends. That's listening to the voices on the ground. Um, another way that our kind of grassroots work is driven um, is through needs assessments. Um, to further inform um, how we engage with the folks on the ground. Um, and what usually has happened for us, um, especially in these last couple of years, um, with the immigration concerns that a lot of our mixed status families are having here, um, is that partnering with groups that are already existing, where people are trusting of the location, the people, um, the goals of that agency um, is really important. Um, because it's difficult for community members to take aside extra time um, in order to really participate in these things. Um, so by partnering and engaging with our community and the agencies that we work with, um, we are able to participate in a lot of their on the ground efforts. One um, in particular that we are doing a lot with this year um, is a culture of trust um, within one of our school districts where a lot of our children go. Um, so myself and one of our other legal partners alternate going and participating in these meetings, one, to better understand the needs of the community and how they like these needs to be um, addressed, um, and then also to participate and offer our expertise in helping that community move forward their particular objectives. Um, so what we found is that it's, we're most successful in grassroots movement if we attach ourselves to something that's already happening and driven by the community because these community members, they know their lives, they're the expert in their lives, um, and we owe it to them to listen. I'm not surprised that, our, that Australia is more grassroots, that the health justice in Australia is more grassroots than um, medical legal partnership in the United States. I think actually the two different brands or pieces of jargon that we keep toggling between health justice, uh, which is a concept, which is a principle, as opposed to medical legal partnership, which um, seems to vaunt this, this dual sector integration, I think actually is very emblematic of that lag that we have in the United States. I also, um, again, as a, a student of Australian society, uh, I would wager that the phrase truth and reconciliation has made its way into your mainstream media 
in a way uh, with respect to uh, Aboriginal history uh, that does basically makes any conversation about reparations that you may be hearing in the United States uh, pale in comparison. Uh, this, I believe the word reparations has only came up in this, this pre-presidential election campaign moment for the first time in our nation, nation's history. Um, so, so I do think we have to um, acknowledge just how powerful the cultural forces of resistance in the United States are to uh, literal truth telling about um, oppression and specifically race-based oppression. Uh, and one of the ways that um, MLPB thinks about how to navigate these challenges in this landscape um, is to uh, draw upon uh, and celebrate ways that the health community and the uh, justice community can actually um, elevate voices and power, sh power sharing with community members. One example is um, the fact that in most legal aid organizations in the United States, there is a uh, required ratio of representation uh, on boards of directors, which have, frankly, you know, uh, significant power over the direction, strategic direction of a particular legal organization. Um, so that is a good thing. And one of the things that we bring in our technical assistance work to healthcare is that they should be organizing their systems of governance more like more like the, the justice community does um, and sort of drawing upon those parallels. It will be uh, important, I think, for uh, us in America doing this work to be um, considering rapidly um, foregrounding the principle of health justice over the descriptive um, medical legal partnership uh, jargon. Thank you. Are there other questions? Hi. Do you want me to come and ask it? Or if, if you would hi. like to, it's yeah. easier than interpreting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, ladies. Thank you. My name hi. is Marissa Marion. Um, I'm from the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre in Melbourne, in Australia. We have a partnership with MD Anderson. Just to give you mm. a bit of a geography lesson, Melbourne has a population of just under six million. Um, and so in terms of services, I guess we're privileged. Um, I don't have a kangaroo in my backyard. However, we it is very vast country, Australia, and I'll, I'll make one specific example, a town called Mildura, which is about four and a half, five hours away, about 552 kilometres from where I live and population of about 60,000 with one oncologist uh, serving that population mm -hmm. only. So he's a tad busy, you can imagine. So I guess my question, my concern is, so Peter McCallum is the largest cancer hospital in Australia. How do we, do I have grave concerns about our regional um, communities, our regional people accessing services. Is this something that you faced with setting up your partnerships? Have you got any advice um, for us with with a patient cohort everywhere, with you know a kangaroo in the backyard as well? Mm. Can I ask? A, can, can I can I can I ask a clarifying question before you leave? Absolutely. I hear, I hear you describing, if I'm not mistaken an access to oncology care gap that is profound if you're talking about one oncologist for, for such a yeah, large and, region, right? And, and that's just an example. There is a lack of uh, general practitioners. The government is currently um, giving an initiative scheme to school teachers. They will get additional funding if they move to rural areas, mm. um, paramedics. Um, so we're trying to get um, doctors and lawyers and teachers out okay. to these areas. Yeah, so throwing okay. money at them to move out. Okay, let me let me turn to Dr. Floyd, who may be the unequivocally is best positioned to answer this one. Um, so what I hear is actually similar to a lot of the challenges we have to access here in the United States. 
Um, I give the example of like my kids close to my clinic, what their poverty looks like is so very different than the poverty of children in central California, which is only like an hour and a half drive. Um, but it's similar where you don't have um, the ease in terms of numbers of services, as well as um, the distance of services from their actual location. Um, so the ways that this has been addressed are similar to what you're describing. Um, there are financial incentives and different types of loan repayment programs for folks to go out to those areas and deliver services. Um, one of the things that has been particularly helpful, um, and this is not speaking for my MLP experiences, but just speaking about access, is telemedicine. So basically being present to take care of a patient and their issue um, in a mobile capacity. So a person who is sitting in Sydney or Melbourne is able to sign onto a computer. That patient and family is on the opposite side on another computer, um, and they're able to deliver services in that manner. Um, here, that's been covered by our local Medicaid or public insurance um, and has increased access to legal resources and health resources that are necessary for people that live in far outlying areas um, so that they don't miss out on that much needed care. Um, I would say in terms of forecasting um, what is probably most effective, um, telemedicine or teleservices um, will probably end up being the more effective option um, simply because a lot of these programs that incentivize people to go to the areas only do so for three years or so. Um, so it creates turnover that then still creates this inequity um, in quality and availability of services for folks that live further away. And if, and if I could take my moderator hat off, um, since I, I did live in the equivalent of kangaroo land in, in the United States for a period of time when I worked with Medical Legal Partnerships, um, certainly part of the solution is tele, tele approaches or video conference approaches. Um, one of the nice things about being in rural communities is that it's tips, typically getting people to partner together is much yeah. easier. Being in New York City, you have so many stakeholders and you have to change so many minds. But in rural America, you might have six people that need to agree, and yeah. oh, then those people typically know one another. Yeah. So partnering in rural areas tends to be a lot easier than rural areas. Um, and, and I think that's a key element in addition to the video conferencing yeah. um, element um, as well. Thank you. We've got a question, question. Yeah. the back. Oh, yeah. Susie. I can translate. Hi, Susie. Um, you, see, you know, we've talked about health justice as a language rather than individual partnership. And here we're thinking more even about health justice as outcomes rather than the partners in, in partnership. Just to get your reflections on who are the other partners that you guys are working with? Um, and and that just reflecting on conversations we've had where you talked about the family um, as leading the partnership and the lawyers and doctors standing behind those, um, those words. Can you read about that? So if you, you couldn't hear, I'll, I'll read. Um, so um, because the Medical Legal Partnership movement was largely framed around things like the physician and the attorney relationship, right? Um, it, that was the framing. But in reality, there's still a lot of people that were considered ancillary to the movement originally, who we know are very important. But that also is really important to help justice Australia because they're really trying to diversify the type of people who are considered health contributors, right? Um, mm -hmm. So can you speak to the importance of other people who aren't the physicians and aren't the attorneys in the American movement because that's really important in Australia because it's a much diverse, much more diverse landscape of providers. Um, uh, yes, go, no, 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 please go ahead. Um, so uh, one thing that, um, an example that I have that's not just lawyers and doctors um, is we have a collaborative called Watch Me Grow um, and what it does is it focuses on socially and developmentally complex children who are at risk for non-accidental trauma or child abuse in particular. Um, and in that collaborative, there are people from the school systems, um, so from special education as well as general education. There are also public health nurses um, who are also from the medical side but deliver services in the home of a patient. Um, as well as social workers, our legal team, physicians who are both general physicians and specialty physicians, um, all sitting around the same table talking about cases together um, and communicating the results of these discussions with um, 
the schools, their pediatricians, and any other people who need to know. Um, there's been a lot of a push towards interdisciplinary teaming in this way um, that I don't think is just germane to um, the medical legal partnership movement, just because within the culture of both law, if I'm correct, Samantha, you'll tell me, um, and um, in medicine, where recognizing that your job cannot just be done by you um, is something that's more of a norm now. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of whether or not um, I can name the people who need to be at the table, it very much depends on um, the population that you're serving and the issues that come up. Um, yeah, I'll let Samantha take over. That was, that was wonderful, Susie, your, your question talking about your good question could, could fill another hour, so I'm going to be disciplined and be brief. Um, like many specialized professions, a lot of valuable information has been long locked up, so to speak, inside the legal profession in our country. And you heard Dr. Floyd eloquently speak earlier about how, how critical it is to, um, to relay, to convey to allied professionals, to allied sectors, to people themselves, what their legal risks, rights, and remedies are in a range of contexts. Now we'll set aside for your next conference the role of complexity in law as a barrier to access to justice in and of itself, because who could keep track of all of this in one's, in one's life? It's hard enough even as a legal professional. But I, I would point us to, in the United States, the growing a wonderfully snowballing community health worker movement as a movement to watch and frankly a movement to ally with because the community health worker movement at least here is premised in um, uh, training and recruiting and um, empowering people with lived experience uh, to perform um, health work in community settings and in ways that may, not always, but may actually engender um, more trust and uh, open communication with uh, individuals and families and communities than some medical profession and legal profession um, communications historically. And so, uh, Susie, if I were to pick one, one sort of trend to watch in the US that is, in a sense, um, democratizing a bit of care delivery, um, and we just have to keep our eyes on who has what special specialty expertise and how we manage quality, but also innovating the delivery of social, economic, and environmental care in the US, so to speak, in partnership with individuals and families. I would really encourage us all to look at the community health worker movement. Uh, thank you. I think we're at time, unless there's another question. I would just love to wrap things up, if Perfect. that's okay. You can translate, James. I just wanted to share with Baraka and Sam that our framing of health justice didn't come out of a vacuum. We've learned so much from our colleagues in the U.S. over 20 years of work this morning, and so it's a real validation of what they've been able to share with us, that we've been able to continue the evolution of the movement. So I really just want them to feel our appreciation for their so, so Tessa yeah, said a you. bunch of really amazing things, yeah. and, and her ability to be like uh, emoting that I can't repeat. But um, she's, yeah. she's very genuine yeah. and thankful for for the MLP movement and, and helping to inform their work. But uh, as a person also being here who comes from the U.S., I'm really inspired by their work because in reality the direction they're going is probably the next generation of what we need to do in the United States. And we probably need to consider reframing some of our work to more accurately depict what affects human health because it's not simply medicine. Um, mm -hmm. And so this, I, there's a lot of key learnings that could come the other way as well. So oh, yeah. thank you. And Ted said very nice things. <laughs>